Chapter 38. Peace in our time. Be good, or I'll shoot you dead. Enough. My abused body was through. My nerves didn't even have the will to scream at me anymore. My muscles ached dully. My insides hurt. My pitbuck leg itched. I could feel the mud slowly squishing between my armor and coat, seeping through the hole in the Ultra Sentinel had burned in my chest. I didn't care. My friends needed me. Loved Remedy was unconscious. Oh please, let her just be unconscious. I tried to save her from drowning, but she'd gone under more than once, and now she was just lying there, unmoving. A few yards away, the scab bandit was half sunken in the lake, the front end thrust up to over the muddy shore. I heard a grunt from the air to my left, where Calamity hung from the scab bandit's harness. Ugh. Ugh. Calamity's legs clicked circles in the air. Ah, oh, pony feathers. My attentions were focused on Velvet Remedy. I was desperate to get closer to her, to see if she was alright, but my body ignored me. I tried to pull her close. A magic flickered over her limp form and died. Too much strain. She wasn't breathing. I could see no lift and fall in her body. Oh, goddesses. Velvet Remedy wasn't breathing. Calamity! I shouted hoarsely, terror surging through me. Velvet's not breathing! Help her! I'm trying! Clement shouted Bask, suddenly thrashing in his harness. I can't get down! His wings flapped it, and his hooves kicked. My mind was exploding in panic. Every second, she was dying, and I couldn't get to her. Couldn't even crawl. My horn flared with a surge of adrenaline. There was not enough in me to wrap around Velvet, but that flush of power was enough to pull apart the clasps of Calamity's harness, dropping the rust-colored Pegasus into the mud. He scrambled to Velvet's side and began pumping his hooves against her breast, pausing only to breathe for her. Behind him, a groan rose up from the Sky Bandit, slipping further into the lake. With a start, I realized Steel Hooves was still in the back of the passenger wagon, paralyzed in his dead armor unable to move as he sunk into the water. I knew we couldn't drown, but the thought of him being trapped in a watery grave had to be horrifying. My mind immediately conjured memories of a nightmarish imprisonment in the healing booth. Calamity continued feverently, trying to bring back Velvet Remedy. Tones of gray bled into my vision. My whole self cried out for rest, begging me to just let go, just go to sleep, but I fought the cool embrace of darkness, the little pony in my head kicking and screaming, telling me that if I let it overtake me, I would never wake up again. If I lost consciousness now, I could slip into a coma, and somehow, I knew it wouldn't be a peaceful sleep. All the nightmares of the healing booth awaited me down there. I heard a choked, sputtering cough from Velvet Remedy. My panic lifted my heart crying out. Thank the goddesses. The grip of panic erased, uh, eased my heart and mind. The blackness rushed in on me like a surging ocean. I think I heard Calamity fire his battle saddle and yell something, but he sounded too far away. Then nothing. Visions of my life in Stable 2 passed before my eyes. Boring. Dull. Safe gray, devoid of any real life, empty of friends or purpose, a job where I was helping no pony. Out of a sense of responsibility and hope, I braved the possible nothingness beyond the stable door, leaving that peace behind, trading for pain and horror as I searched for her. I remember my first day and how the daylight seemed so strange to me, beautiful, yet odd and unhealthy. Strained or stained by the curtain of clouds above us. I saw how stupid and foolish I had been, plunging headlong into places like Iron Shod Firearms and Stable 24, repeatedly risking my life, and later those of my friends, driven by curiosity and a need for answers. I was lucky to still be alive. 
My friend swam before me. My fearless first friend, Calamity, always by my side, always ready to catch me when I fell. I owed him my life, over and over. Velvet Remedy, the real mare, not the one of my foolish fantasies, with the caring heart who tended to me when I was sick, and who took my burden when the return home was too much for me to bear. Steel Hooves, met in battle with a fury of explosions. I had seen him conquer his own demons, to fight alongside Zenith, and to finally step up to lead a new force for the good of Equestria. And Zenith herself, pulled from Red Eye's hell of industry and slavery, a tortured mare, a survivor who had become our guide in Old Olne, one of the most grim and deadly places the Wasteland has to offer. My mind filled with voices, and the voice of DJ Pwn3, broadcasting out of Manhattan, bringing messages of warning and hope, and making us out to be heroes. I remembered that first real voice from my past, the message from Scootaloo, a hello from one of the ponies who had shaped the world and watched it fall. From them, I learned of virtues, of sacrifice, and of failure. Even though they were gone, they had become my family almost as much as my living friends. I was no longer alone. I recalled moments of joy, times I had almost forgotten. Breakfast with God at Junction R7. My water fight with homage in the pouring rain. My head filled with shadows. The horribly damaging Pinky Bell with her balefire bomb she was saving for fireworks. The accidental shot on Buckland Bridge. I dreamt that I was drowning in blood, a crimson river from all those whom I had slain. The memory of Arbru transformed that terror into reality. Of all the things I had struggled against, raiders, enslavers, zombie zebras, and even a dragon, the greatest threat had always been for myself. The darkness and the rage that hid within me, addiction and failure. My soul was weary. I needed rest. Hadn't I been through enough? I had tried to do good. I had tried to help. I had pushed myself through torture and horror. Death awaited me, and I could hear the sweet, uh, cajolin sound of the Grim Reaper pony, offering me final respite. I wanted to go to her. Let her wrap me in her cloak of blackness and unending sleep. But even here, the little pony in my head fought with me, reminding me that there was still too much to do before I could allow myself peace. There were still ponies who needed me. Red Eye still threatened Ten Pony Tower and my beloved homage. There was still a goddess out there, bent on the extinction of pony kind through unity. As long as you're willing to face the fire, well, fuck. My little pony was right. As much as I yearned otherwise, I had to return to regain consciousness. I moaned, rolling onto my side. My body was covered in a sticky sweat. Unpleasant warmth rushed through me, and my head and stomach churned with nausea. I itched from dry mud. I was laying on a filthy cot in a ramshackle wooden structure that stank of damp wood and rot. I tried to put myself up, my legs trembling weakly before giving out. The effort caused my gut to rebel, and I found the strength to roll over and vomit. Mercifully, there was an old mop bucket next to the bed, something that existed just for the purpose of being filled with my sickness. My throat burned, and the inside of my mouth turning horrid. The stench of my throw up made my eyes water, and drove my stomach to churn and release even more. I collapsed back, tears in my eyes. This had happened before. Illness, brought on by physical overexertion, mental turmoil, and the nastiness of the wasteland. I needed to go, but I didn't have time to be bedridden again for days. Canterlot had been 
uh, physiologically brutal. The pink cloud and the broadcasters putting my brain at insides through the grinder. The loss of a rib was traumatic and terrifying. The scar there, like the one on my neck, would never fully heal. My pipa could fuse to my coat and flesh. Was that any surprise my health was falling apart? The memory orbs had been emotionally gut-wrenching. Part of me screamed to gallop back to the Ministry of Peace, just to give Rarity a proper burial. But even before we had left the Ministry of Awesome, the fires and cloud had made that impossible. The heart-rending blow of watching Applejack step out of that elevator, and realizing that Applesnack had intended to propose to her that very night, and she was anticipating it. Oh, goddesses. I fought to get up, only to fail again. I must not be this weak. My sickness could be costing lives. Goddesses, where was I? My eyes moved slowly over the filth. A few empty bottles, rubbish, a doorway without a door, and the stained sheets that covered it. Not steal who's shack. Now, let's stuff to get you set up like that. I heard Calamity's voice drift in from the next room, followed by a loud thump of metal against glittering wood. I felt the urge to call out to him. The gal was not fine enough to let me rent this here set of magically powered armor long enough to get us to Rabucha. Should have you mobile in no time. Are you sure you know what you're doing, Calamity? Silhu's voice followed. Maybe you should wait for little Pip. And leave you all stuck like this? Zenith chimed in. Is it wrong that I want to stick him in that pose? Even feeling as rich as I did, I had to bury my muzzle into the mattress to stifle a snicker. I felt better knowing three of my friends were just on the other side of that filthy curtain. Try it, and I will hurt you, Steel has warned, grumbling. Calamity. Hurry. So, which end do I plug this into again? Calamity asked, feigning confusion. The levity in his voice betrayed him. Just hurry, before the zebra gets any other ideas. Thank you, Steel Hooves, Zena said quietly, for helping my daughter's village. I know it must be hard for an old soldier to help zebra kin. I mentally grasped at that thought that was swimming through my head. We were in Glyphmark. Through the doorway, I realized the next room had fallen still. Applejack was afraid of zebras, Sulu's finally said. It took her little sister to show her that they are people just like ponies. Good folk, most of them. I listened, surprised, as Applesnack opened up to Zenith. She never fought that, forgot that. Not even in the blackest hours of the war. Not even when her closest zebra friend betrayed her. His voice seemed to freeze. Steelhoof's low, rumbling voice, it possibly dropping even lower. Or so we believed. Again, the ruby on mine filled with a pregnant quiet. Applejack would have wanted her rangers to protect all good people, not just ponies. I loved Steelhoof's a little more at that moment. After a moment, Calamity spoke up, changing the topic. How are they? Neither has woken, Zenith's voice turned solemn. Neither? Velvet Rand was still unconscious? I once again felt a twang of panic. How long has it been since Canterlot? Although Little Pip moans and mutters fevered things in her sleep. Little Pip is awake, Steelhoof's announced. She's probably eavesdropping. I also hated Steel Hooves, just a little bit right then. Go ahead and put him in silly poses, Zenith. I was shivering when Zenith came in. Some of my body had gone from overly hot to unpleasantly cold. The metal ghoul was right, Zenith intoned casually. You are awake. What, what about Velvet? She still slumbers, Zenith informed me. I gave her what saddles and remedies I know. 
but only she can find her way back to us, as you have done. She will, I assured her. Love Remedy is stronger than she looks. So what are you? The zebra said, as she placed a hoof on my forehead, just below my horn. I groaned. Well, that's easy when you look pathetic. Zina smirked, ever so slightly. We need to go, I started to say, trying a third time to stand. I forced my fort hooves under me, lifting myself just enough to reach the mop bucket as another wave of nausea slept over me. Zenith watched as I vomited. You are sick, she said grimly, and quite unnecessarily. You need to rest. I will not allow us to go, and lo go anywhere until you are well enough for the journey. Another day at least, maybe two. How long? I asked, spitting into the bucket of sick, trying to clear the acidic foulness from my tongue and teeth. Less than a day, Zenith told me. Clem may be negotiating with your trader friend to get the things you need, and he has been putting armor on our flying vessel. If there's one thing Glyphmark is not poor in, it is scraps. I wondered when he was going to get around to that. Nodding, I tried to reason with Zenith. One night, but then we have to go. I'll prop myself up with crutches if I have to. No. Zenith said flatly. I decide when we go. And I say, not until you are at least able to walk on your own and hold food. Until then, and only then, will I consider it. Assuming that the medical pony hasn't woken up by then, and had you chained down until you are fully healed. I moaned, slipping back under my bed. I couldn't wait that long. Especially if El Remedy did decide to chain me down until I was getting till I got better. Something Velvet was more than capable of. Zenith might not realize that, but then the zebra wasn't there when Velvet Remedy shot me. I can recover on the ride of Splendid Valley, I told her, recalling having said something similar to Velvet Remedy after Arbru. But the mere thought of riding the Sky Bandit made my head whimper and my stomach twist unpleasantly. Okay. Once I can hold food. I wasn't going to subject the others to a ride in the passenger wagon with me while I spent the whole trip with my head in a bucket. My mind wandered for a moment, trying to retrace the days. How long ago had Velvet Remedy shot me with a poison dart gun? How long since I left Stable 2? My whole life was condensed into, what, eight weeks? Over a month and a half not quite two months. The equally miserable little pony in my head pointed out that between now and Steelhoof Shack, I'd used up all my sick days, and soon the master pitbuck technician would have to dock my allowance. I found myself giggling. Laughter, Zenith mused, a sure sign of regaining health, or slipping into his sanity. That just made me giggle harder, for no good reason. Zenith got up, taking the mop bucket's handle in her teeth. The stench from it had begun to permeate the room. I felt simultaneously thankful towards her, and embarrassed at my disgusting frailty. I was sorry to be the reason she had to be doing something so unpleasant. My mind caught on something as she started towards the filthy curtain. Zenith, how's your daughter? And have you told her yet? The zebra stopped. She set down the bucket of vomit and turned towards me. Zephyr is doing well. She is the doctor for these town folks and plies her craft well. She is very thankful for what we have done here. Zina sat down, staring off into the air. She and the others of her village have released me from my responsibility, so I am free to go. She looked at me sternly. As to your second question, no. And I wish that you would not tell her. I nodded. But shouldn't she know? And Zenith, you deserve to be reunited with her. Zenith smiled sadly. She is her own mare now, not the little girl I knew. 
I'd rather she kept that strength than submit to being my child again. She looked away again. And, to be truthful, I cannot be responsible for her. I do not know how. Plus, you need me more than she does. With that, Zenith stood back up, taking the mop bucket once again, and walked out, the curtain waving in past her. I lay there for some time, unsure of how to feel. Part of me was happy that Zenith could be with us again. Another part of me, the part which deeply wished for a happy ending with my friends, was softly crying. I wasn't even sure why. My own mother, as much as I loved her from a distance, was not as important to me as my friends, and I would not wish to sacrifice any time with my friends, or the good I was trying to do, for a reunion with her. So out of my heart desire for Zenith and Zephyr to be together again. I shivered again. Part of me wanted to pull down the disgusting curtain and wrap myself in it. But a better part of me shuddered at the thought. And I knew that, if I did, I would just become too hot again. Instead, I curled up, a wave of weariness passing over me. We needed Zenith. I needed her. We were stronger together. Better. I would need my friends. Soon. As soon as I was well enough to function. We would be enacting my plan. Whatever that was. To deal with the goddess. I moaned. As another shiver quaked through my body. Suddenly. I felt nervous. Scared. I was about to risk our lives with a plan I didn't even know. I was trusting myself, which was beginning to feel awfully stupid. They all trusted me, but should they? I hadn't told them what I was doing, just their specific parts. No one knew what we were doing. This was insane. I've got a plan for dealing with the goddess. I've told every pony their parts, and just their parts. I'm the only pony who knows all of it. And then, I took that knowledge from myself, and locked it away in orbs, sitting far away in Ten Pony Tower. What was I thinking? Literally, what was I thinking? I've told every pony their parts, and just their parts. Every pony. Oh! Because the zebra, the goddess, couldn't read zebra minds. A smile broke across my muzzle. Oh, I was a clever pony. She did what now? Calamity gasped, startling me from the near sleep my aching body had fallen into. Damn it, Lil Pip promised me. Oh no, what did I do? I immediately felt awful for whatever I had done to upset Calamity. Calm yourself, Steelhoofs commanded softly. Everything was fine. Was Steelhoofs mobile yet? It didn't sound like he had moved. The idea that he still might be paralyzed within his armor was horrible. I thought of how he had been trapped helplessly under the water and prayed to Celestia and Luna that he had been pulled out quickly. Fine? I was gone. You were immobile, and Lil Pip goes poking her head into a whole heap of mess of memory orbs right in the middle of the Cantalot ruins? Calamity roared. Damn it! I know that mare ain't got no sense at all. Sometimes. But I'd expected her to treat a promise better. What does she expect Velvet to do if y'all were attacked? Or if the cloud got in? Turn on the shield, Steelhoo said simply. Clementy stopped mid-rant. What now? We were inside the Ministry of Awesome, within its shielded zone. If anything happened, Velvet Remedy could have protected us with the throw of a switch. Steelhoo informed him, adding the jab. Or, don't you trust Rainbow Dash's defenses? I could hear Calamity let out a long sigh of defeat. Fine. Okay. She's not responsible for Velvet Remedy's condition, Steelhoofs added. In fact, she risked drowning herself to save her. I know that, and I'm not mad at her because, uh, hell, I'm not mad at her. I'm just mad, Calamity admitted. 
Feels better than to be worried sick. I heard a crack of wood and dust shifted down from the, uh, from the bottom of the ceiling boards as the small building shook from Calamity's kick. I could understand the sentiment. Hell! Over time to let a pony down, Calamity. What? I seem to recall you saved them. My thoughts echoed Steelhu's sentiment. Calamity had caught us, and then he had saved Velvet when I could not. Yeah, well, they would have wouldn't have needed so much attention if I'd just flown us out of there. My fault we ended up in the moat. Hell, I don't even remember touching down. Calamity, I called out weakly. Stop. Just not your fault. That was all the energy I had to shout. And it left me panting. The orange maned Pegasus poked his head through the curtains and hovered a pony's height off the ground. Little Pip, I'm sorry. I thought you were asleep. Part of me regretted letting him see me like this. I was drenched in sweat. My coat was matted to my skin beneath, and I hadn't bathed since being dropped in the mud. I shook my head, then weakly hoof waved at him. A Pegasus landed uh, to pass through the doorway, stepping up to the old stained mattress that served as my bed. Can I get you anything? Water? A blanket? He frowned. Not sure we got any of those. And the water here ain't exactly the best, neither. I wanted both. But I asked for neither. Calamity. Thank you. I said, smiling as best I could. Velvet and I both owe you our lives. You were... awesome. He shook his head. Thanks all the same for saying, but... But nothing. It... It's been... Hard and hurtful on all of us. Sometimes, I just want to stop. I trailed off, ashamed. I felt like I wanted to stop a lot lately. I know what you mean. A lesser pony would have called it quits a long time ago. Clement laid down next to me. He pulled out the pink gem and set it between us. Thank you for this, little pip. I got right messed up in the head after Buckland Cross, and I hate what happened there, and it was sending me to dark places in my mind. You gave me something to remind me that we are the good guys. We don't always get it right. Hell, sometimes we mess it up real bad. But we keep trying, and there are folk better off thanks to us. I nodded, staring into the gem. I hate this plan of yours. Calamity told me bluntly. Once again, you're going into some place insanely dangerous alone. And once again, you're the only one who can do it. I hate that. I'm going in alone? The idea of going into Maripony, or worse, all of Splendid Valley, alone, terrified me. I no longer like this plan either. On the other hoof, it didn't surprise me. I knew myself too well. Any chance to spare my friends the danger, any way I could make my burden alone, and I would take it. I had done it again. Y'all remember what that place did to us last time, Clement reminded me. And we were together then. Calamity? I asked, worried now. What can you tell me about the plan? Calamity blinked. His eyes widened as he realized what I was saying. What? Y'all don't know? I mean, I knew that you had your memories removed, but you really don't know nothing about the plan? He was beginning to panic. Didn't you even leave yourself any notes? Notes? Where would I? I stopped. Damn it, of course. My pit buck. How could I have not have thought of that before? Slowly, I lifted my right foreleg, my gaze sliding to the dead screen of my pit buck. Ah, uh, Calamity, you rebooted Steelhoof's armor, right? Is he able to move again? I felt supremely stupid and foolish. 
Calamity winced. Uh, actually, no. My eyes widened. Steel hooves had been immobile this whole time. Turns out, it ain't as easy as it look. I ain't a certified pit buck technician and toaster repair pony, after all. Then, I started to pull myself off the mattress, determined that steel hooves not remain paralyzed a moment longer. My forelegs trembled, and my stomach shot me a queasy warning. I looked around, but the mop bucket wasn't back yet. I laid back down, putting a hoof over my muzzle, my muzzle and tried to force my inside still. Could you bring him in here, please? My head was swimming again. Trying to remember just what I needed to do was like slogging through belly-deep sludge. I needed tools, the spell matrix master key, and something to reboot him from. And could you fetch my utility barding? And you borrowed magically powered armor from some pony? I'll do my best, Calamity said, looking energized. He's kind of heavy. I nodded, wondering how they got steel hooves inside in the first place, or out of the water. My eyes widened as I remembered something else. There was a shot. Calamity started, jumping up and looking around. Where? You sure? I didn't hear nothing. I shook my head, whimpering slightly at how sick the sudden movement made me feel. No, before, at the lake, you shot something. Calamity visibly relaxed. Oh, that shot. I was catching the griffin's attention. Apparently, some folk tend to notice when a passenger wagon falls out of cantaloupe. Steelu sat silently by my side. I was feverish and having trouble focusing, but I was finished. I started disconnecting my pit buck from his armor, glancing once more at the set of badly damaged power armor laying in the corner. I'm sorry, I told him, wiping a sick coat of sweat from my face. We should have had you moving faster. I felt so tired. Steelu said nothing. But it wasn't a damning silence. His tail shifted. I pulled my tools away. Done. I cast another look at the armor Calamity had rented for this and winced. Sometimes, things just weren't fair. It was steel ranger armor. Torn up, but with a still functioning spell matrix that I had been able to use to restore my pit buck, and then use my pit buck to restore steel hooves. There were still traces of pony blood in it. I chose to restore my pit buck first, not merely because it was easier, but because I felt steel hooves would rather not be connected directly to the other armor. The magically powered armor had been taken from the body of one of the rangers we had killed at Stable 2. From the damage, it was a pony whom steel hooves had put down himself. Steel hooves stood up. He tested each leg, then stretched. Thank you, he said solemnly. Now rest. I curled up, part of me hating what he saw, hating that he saw this, but being unable to properly care. I really wanted nothing more than to sleep, and hopefully not dream. I watched him as he turned towards the doorway. He would just walk out as if everything was concluded, but it wasn't. Apple snack, I whispered, but I knew he heard it by the way he stopped. I wasn't sure if this was what I should be doing, but no more secrets. I saw you. You see me often. In one of the orbs, in the ministry, I told him. It was the memory of a guard. He was assisting Zakora on a mission to help get her closer to Caesar. Steelu said nothing, but the temperature in the room seemed to drop. You were going to propose to Applejack that night. I looked at him, my heart squeezing in my chest. I'm so sorry. Closer to Caesar, Steelu repeated. To do what? 
I closed my eyes. I don't know. Spy on him, I think. Or assassinate him. I shook, feeling a chill that was more from sickness than reaction to his words. I don't know, but I don't think so. I wasn't sure why. Maybe it was the way Zakora had worried about pony deaths, or how her inexpert fighting skills caused her likely to kill my host by accident. But I just didn't feel like Zakora was that kind of killer. I cringed as I realized I was. She was a spy. Simmer down, Sally. Zakora ain't no spy. The world was filled with sharp-edged irony. Stilu stood there, as unmoving as he had been all day. Finally, he said, It wouldn't have mattered. Killing the Caesar wouldn't have stopped the war. The Legatus Legionaris would have simply stepped in. And, if anything, he was worse. I swallowed, my mouth tasting filthy. Steel hooves. Apple snack. I'm not judging you. I'm saying... What was I saying? I fought for words. I'm saying I understand now. I know what you meant when you said I made it easier for you to live with yourself. And... I'm sorry. He nickered. Applejack never knew the truth about Sakura either, I told him. And she loved you. She tried to fight for your relationship because she loved you. And, I think, because she understood. Not approved, but understood. Steel Hooves walked out. I was trapped, buried alive, encased in a coffin of metal. There was no air. I could not breathe. Sounds, horrible, horrible sounds, came at me from the darkness. Warping, unearthly tones. Rending sounds. The sounds of saws. I tried to back away, but there was no room. My backside hit a smooth surface. Not metal, but glass. And I felt a shock of cold. My hooves splashed into the sickly warmth of blood, and I could smell the sick, coppery stench. My healing booth coffin was filling with it. You cut a bloody swath through them. How many ponies are dead tonight because of you, little pip? Valdorini's voice echoed accusingly, provoking a sickening deja vu. How many ponies have you slaughtered? The blood was the blood of Arbru. It sure didn't take you long to become a mass murderer, did it, little pip? The sound of the saw was getting closer. It intended to cut me apart with ragged teeth, to slice open my head and take my brain. Strange symbols appeared, floating in front of me. Alien glyphs of ancient zebra design. But unlike the sounds and voices and darkness, their pulsing lines of crimson and black were soothing. They shifted in odd dimensions, offering to unlock themselves, to protect me. I knew these, and they were blasphemous. I turned away. I was facing the mirror. I stared back at myself, bleeding, dying. Little Pip, the raider. My expression was grim, hateful. The stream of blood was pouring out of the mirror, the blood of Arbru coming from my body mixing with my own. The saw was getting closer. I could feel the wind from its gnarling, spinning teeth, blasting my mane. It was going to cut out my heart, rip me open, and wrench out my spine. It would hurt, hurt so badly, but I wouldn't be allowed to die. Let us help you, the glyphs whispered. You have no power. You have no purpose. Let us give you purpose. I have a purpose, I shouted at the raider little pip in the mirror. I'm not the wasteland survivor. Homage, I heard myself saying. You are. 
You and them. I'm just the one who clears the way. You could be the savior, the glyphs whispered, floating in the air around the mirror. I realized I can understand most of them. Let me show you secrets. I don't want your secrets, I shouted at the glyphs, but I was lying. I'd seen the blackness that the book held, the horror. But you've seen how much good we can do in the hooves of the right pony. You cannot deny. I... I whimpered, faltering. I knew that was true. Even the blackest magic could be used for good. But... I'm no rarity. I'm weak. I could make you stronger. Better. D don't My gaze locked on the raider in my soul. She trembled, dying from blood loss. She was grotesque. Horrible. I'm not this! I crawled out. I have a purpose! It. It's not us, is it? I heard my voice cry. We're not the right group of friends. We can't bring Equestria back. No. Spike's voice laughed at me. You're not. The saw was so close now. If I didn't take the glyphs for protection, it would start cutting me. Let me show you so many secrets. No! I screamed, crying. I wanted those secrets. I tried to fight, but I really, really wanted them. The saw was gone. The noises stopped. The healing booth was no longer a coffin. And I was no longer alone. Enough of this, Rarity said, stepping forward. She glared at the glyphs. You leave her alone. When? How? The beautiful white unicorn gave me a sad frown. I was not that strong either. She stared back at the glyphs as the other ministry mares walked up from the darkness behind me. The Black Book preys upon you when you're weak and alone. But you are not alone anymore. I'm... How? Cause you brought us together, didn't you? Applejack smiled. It's what you do. I think I know what you're looking for. I remember telling Spike. It's difficult, or it's happening differently this time, isn't it? Twilight Sparkle's voice was curious. Well, duh! Rainbow Dash hovered over her. Do you think it was the same when it was just Celestia? Same as boring. I reckon it's different every time. I was confused, yet comforted. I didn't know how, but they were with me. And with them, I had the strength to refuse and fight. But you don't want to fight, do you? Let me give you a taste of what I have to offer. Hey, Pinky, this is a great party, but I've got something that'll make it even better, Pinkie Pie said dourly, her expression cross. She was staring at the floating runes, but I didn't think she was quite seeing what the rest of us were. You've got to try these. Just take one. They'll blow your mind. Her hoof stomped. Another voice echoed out of the darkness. Have you given up your principles for the greater good yet? Red Eye asked. I see you've already become a monster. Or did you think I wouldn't hear about our brew? The blood began to rise. I don't like this feller, Applejack hissed. And look at that. Red Eye's voice mocked as I felt a burning in my right forehoof where my pit buck had merged with my flesh. You are becoming more like me every day. I'm not like you, I asserted, lying again. And I'm not a monster. I knew I was. I could see it in the mirror. Corrupted kindness, Trixie's voice accused triumphantly, her image floating above the mirror. Fluttershy stepped forward. How would you know? I'm the goddess. I know everything. Hush now, Fluttershy commanded, staring. Quiet now. The image of Trixie faded, looking abashed. Power, the black book cajoled. Purpose. Together, we will unlock the world. 
Don't listen to it. Rarity strengthened. Applejack rested a hoof on my shoulder. He already got a purpose. You're the bringer of light, ain't you? I... I don't even know what that means. I shook my head. I don't have a purpose. I'm lost. I have no idea what I'm doing. Now listen here, Applejack said sternly. What I'm telling you is the honest truth. You do have a purpose. You're the one that brought them together, she said, as images of my friends floating at the edges of my vision. My living friends. Calamity. Velvet Remedy. Steel Hooves. Zenith. Even Pyrolite. They were here with me too. I felt tears. You find the good ones, draw them out, clear the path, and lap the way. Applejack smiled gently. There's a name for that, you know. I wanted to believe her so badly that I was trembling. But I turned back to the mirror, to the shot up, bleeding, dying little pip, and cobbled together gore stained raider armor. Barely standing as she faced down her next kill, little Macintosh floating in front of her, pointed upwards. But this is my soul, isn't it? Of course it is, silly, Pinkie Pie said, hugging me suddenly and pointing at the mirror. You're just looking at it wrong. Look behind you. I woke with a gasp, sitting up suddenly, then collapsed back onto the mattress. I felt awful, damp with sweat, and caked with mud. Filthy. Almost too tired to move. My mind was clumped and stingy. But the nausea was gone, and my fever had broken. I was not alone in the room. Zenith? The zebra who moved closer wasn't my companion. Zephyr, I heard her say, recognizing her. Where is every pony? I mean, every one. Zephyr pulled a wet sponge from the, a tin pot filled with water. Your friends woke up an hour ago, she told me, as she began to wipe my forehead. They're all with her right now. I wished I could be too. Zenith is my mother, isn't she? Zephyr asked. I froze, unsure how to answer. Zenith had asked me not to, but I wanted to do right by her. But if Zephyr already suspected... I thought so, Zephyr said, as she continued to sponge me down, removing some of the illness sweat from my coat. She has tried to hide it, but how many zebra mares named Zenith does she think this wasteland holds? Smart girl. I shivered a little under the cool dampness of the sponge but was immediately thankful for every stroke of it. I wanted a bath so much it hurt. I would be giving my left forehoof for a day at the Ten Pony Spa. You will be going soon, Zenith gleaned. You will be taking her with you. Yes, I'm sorry. I will be happy to see her go, the young zebra mare told me bluntly. I am not ungrateful for all she's done but she would not have done it if you had not led her. I winced. No, that's not true. Yes, it is, Zephyr said, accepting no argument. I love her from a distance. I felt an odd chill at the zebra's words echoed my thoughts from the evening before. But she is not her own mare, and she never will be. I will not be like her. Zenith continued to sponge bath me, in silence. Your father? I began to ask. My father, the young zebra said bitterly, was Quarrel Deathhoof, leader of our parents' tribe, until that slaver griffin killed him. Stern, I was sure of it. I was just a little foal, but I remember how he treated mother and how he ran the tribe. I am not sorry he's dead. 
I knew I shouldn't be moving. My body wanted nothing more but to rest. But I had to see the remedy. And I didn't want to go back to sleep. There were things waiting for me in my dreams. And not all of them were meant for me. Or meant for me well. The ramshackle shack, it would be generous to call it a building, was Glyphmark's attempt at a clinic, and possibly the largest old house in town. The floors were broken, the roof was sagging, but it housed all of us. Velvet Remedy was being kept in what had once been a bathroom. The old tub, water-stained in brown with traces of pink, was the only intact object in the room full of debris and shattered porcelain. I thought I'd lost you, Clement was saying as I approached. I stopped, backing out of sight, not wanting to interrupt. My legs cried out that this was a good time to lay down, or at least lean against something. They were weary and tired of bearing my weight, and if I refused to sleep, the least I could do was get off them. Now you know how I feel every time you go off and do something reckless. Velvet replied with malice, without malice. I, I don't think I could take this anymore without you, Calamity told her. I'm struggling here, Velvet. It feels like all my friends are falling apart, and I'm trying to be the strong one, but I ain't doing so good. I remember what I had heard Calamity mutter to himself as we entered stable too. I gotta be strong for him. Not go crazy. I can't just charge in and kill every armored bitch I see. I need to be strong. Need to watch for him. Need to protect him. I can do this. What's wrong, love? Velvet asked gently. What's eating you? Buck and cross. I winced. I've tried to make peace with it, but... Come closer. Velvet said in response, Let me hold you. I hear Calamity's throat hitch. We were bullies, Velv. Nothing better than bullies. We went into man and something that we knew that couldn't give, and it all ended in blood. Those young knights didn't deserve to die. My friend was crying now. I felt a lump in my throat. My heart twisted into knots. I should have stopped us. I knew better. And that makes it my fault. Hush now, love. Velvet cooed. She knew there wasn't anything she could say, so she wisely said nothing. I imagined she was holding him as he cried into her mane. And I'm terrified that I'm losing you too, Clementy said brokenly. What? No, love. Velvet soothed. You're not losing me. That crap you pulled in the Ministry of Peace says different, Calamity asserted. There was strength in his voice. I could tell he had pulled back from her. No. No, don't say anything. I understand why you did, did it now, I guess. But you're too wrapped up in Fluttershy. Ain't right nor healthy, putting all your faith in a pony you hardly know. I know Fluttershy, Velvet insisted softly. Yeah. But there are things you don't know. Clement replied, and all sorts of alarm bells started going off in my head. Oh? Velvet asked, and I swore the question sounded like poison. Like what? Clement faltered. Well, I don't rightly know. But little Pip seen things in those orbs, and I could hear from the uh, timber in his voice that he knew the hole he was digging. So we changed track. Just remember what DJ Poem 3 always says is the big truth of the wasteland. We all done things that we regret. And well, sounds to me like Fluttershy had some regrets too. And Little Pip is keeping what she knows a secret, isn't she? To protect me, no doubt. I guess that Calamity was nodding. What a surprise. Little Pip creeping secrets from her friends, I swear. If there was an element of frustration... Velvet, please, Calamity said softly. Don't be mad. 
She means whale. Really. And do you think she's right? Do you think I need to be protected from whatever this is? I don't know. Calmly struggled. After the Ministry of Peace? Maybe. He found more solid ground, as he told her. I just know you shouldn't get so wrapped up in trying to be your idol. I had a sudden flash of Pinky Bell. And I bet Velvet Remedy did too. You're wonderful. Lovin'. Caring pony all on your own. Just be yourself. I slipped out of the front door, not wanting to interrupt the quiet moment Calamity and Velvet were sharing. I blinked in the odd daylight, once again recalling how strange the air seemed without the healing light of the sun. Ditsy Doo waved at me. I blinked again, taking in the sight of Ditsy Doo's delivery wagon. Absolutely everything. Yes, I do deliveries. She packed up, or picked up a new companion, I noticed. A griffin bodyguard in talon armor. Now I knew who Calamity had rented the Steel Ranger armor from, and which griffin he'd been signaling. Zenith had given Glyphmark a buck to the town's economy. And Ditsy Do had taken only days to start trade with them. That was amazingly fast for word to have gotten out. I suspect a little of Homage's hoof work. A little lavender filly with a blonde mane trotted towards me. She was smiling, a piece of parchment in her mouth. Here, Miss Lil Pip, Silver Bell said, her voice almost singing. I painted a picture for you. See? It's you and Homage. I floated the parchment up and gazed at the painting. It was a crude child's painting. And it was the most beautiful picture I had ever seen. Ah, you're crying? Don't you like it? I tried really hard. I... I love it. I knelt down and hugged the filly gently. I wondered what I had done to deserve such an innocent and wonderful gift. With deep shame, I remembered that I had once intended to steal from this little filly. Thank you, Silverbell. Ditsy Dew had trotted up beside us. As I let Silverbell go, I noticed that Ditsy had a couple of little chalkboards dangling around her neck. She set one of them down, pulling out a piece of chalk, and scribbled, Hello. Hello, Ditsy Doo, I replied, floating the picture next to me. I would have to find something waterproof to keep it in until we returned to Junction R7, where I intended to put it up in a cherished place next to my bed. Sorba had somehow really captured homage and made her look absolutely adorable. Ditsy Doo erased the board with a hoof, then wrote, Can a horn grow back? She looked at me with an urgent smile, right eye rolling upwards disturbingly. I blinked. I... I don't know. I thought about it some more. A horn is a bone, right? Minutes later, Velvetrum was kneeling next to Silverbell, the older mare's horn glowing as Ditsy Doo, Calamity, and I watched. Now, I've gotten a lot better at this spell, Velvet cautioned, snarkily adding, thanks to an abundance of practice. But all I can do is help the physical horn grow back. I don't know if magic will heal, or how long it will take. Thank you, Miss Velvet Remedy. Silver Bell chimed softly, understanding. Her eyes shifted to Pyrelite, widening, widening along with her smile. The majestic Balefire Phoenix began to sing to Silver Bell. Her song was rich, sadly nostalgic, and overwhelmingly beautiful. Velvetrimity smiled gently and stretched out her magic. The scar on Silver Bell's head, where her, she had cut off her own horn, began to glow.